Explore the history, relationships, expertise, and data that go into ensuring Stein growers get maximum yield potential. This is the Stein Seedcast. Here's your host, David Thompson. Hello, and welcome to the Stein Seedcast. I'm your host, David Thompson, National Marketing and Sales Director for Stein Seed Company. We have another great episode lined up with special guests, expert insights, and discussion on everything you need to know about maximizing yield potential. On today's episode, our special guest is none other than Stein C Company founder and CEO, Harry Stein. Welcome to the show, Harry. Thank you. So this conversation marks a special milestone for the Stein C cast, as this is our 50th episode. So it seemed fitting to celebrate such an occasion with the man who really started it all, Harry Stein. Today, Harry's going to walk us through the history of our business, where we are today as we celebrate our 45th anniversary of the Stein brand, and the future that he envisions for the company. So let's get started. Well, so Harry, first, a little bit of backstory. You know, we're here today on the Stein farm. This is the farm where you grew up. So I wonder if you'd give a little bit of backstory about your history here on uh, on the home place. Well, my father moved to this farm, this rented 200-acre farm, in 1934. And 1934 and 36 were drought years here in central Iowa. So, and as well as in the middle of the Great Depression. <laughs> right. So, so it was kind of a tough go during that period. And obviously, uh, things have worked out reasonably well since then. <laughs> Sure. So you grew up on the place, went off to college, came back, and started working here on the farm? Correct, yes. You know, in those days, in the 60s, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, soybeans were not nearly the the cash crop that they are now, right? So what led you down the path to thinking that soybeans were the future? Well, in the 1950s, we were raising certified seed of public varieties and selling that seed to the primarily local farmers. Sometimes it would be from a distance in Missouri or other places. So I grew up doing this uh, for a long time, but it wasn't any, any plant breeding or the commercial scale that we do today. Sure. And in, in, in those years, the public system, which would be the uh, Agriculture Research Service of the USDA, in conjunction with land-grant universities, put out the new products of wheat, corn, soybeans, mostly the, uh, by this time, mostly the open pollinated crops. Corn had started, as you know, into the 1930s, into hybridization. So at that time, we received a new variety. The variety happened to be Amsoy. And this variety was several bushels better than those that had previously been developed. Incidentally, this was developed by uh, Dr. Weber at Iowa State University. And we had a fairly large allotment of those from the Committee for Ag Development. And my father said we could plant them at half rate. Incidentally, prior to the 1950s, when there were absolutely no herbicides, and soybeans were actually slightly larger then than they are today. So a bushel and a peck was the standard planting rate you know, in order to get them, A, to come out of the ground, and, and B, to compete with the weeds and that sort of thing. So at any rate, we planted those at half rate. We sold those for double the price of regular soybeans. And I thought, wow, I need to look into this <laughs> going forward. Yeah, so that would have been really kind of outside the norm, as you said, the, based on the planting rate that was standard at the time. That created a real opportunity to increase your multiplication of seed at, at, at that rate. Correct. Both the planting rate and the size of our allotment. The Committee for Ag Development at that time gave allotments based on acreage that you'd grown of certified seed. And they favored the large, small growers. So if you were on the high end of the small growers, you actually got a disproportionate share compared to some commercial people that had very large acreage. Hmm. So in that way, you're, again, able to make the best use of the acres that, or the allotment that you had by making a lot out of out of the allotment that you got. Correct. So starting with that, realize there's some real opportunity here if we start looking at how to multiply seeds and find those genetics that are better than others. Because like you said, Amsoy was, was one that was kind of a step change from ones prior to that. So talk a little bit, if you would, about you know the process of, of developing that. You know, as you said, all that work had been public work in those days. So the effort to start a private soybean breeding program. 
Well, Dr. Weber, who I mentioned that had been the, technically he was a USDA employee at Iowa State University, had been the soybean breeder. And he left at that time and was replaced by Dr. Walt Fair. And, and Walt Fair said, you know, if we had a private organization, we could develop things and move much more quickly than the university because of going through the committees and the uh, allocation of resources and all of that sort of thing. So he called a meeting of the certified soybean growers, and there were maybe 30 or 40 people at that meeting. And then he, a secondary meeting, and then by that time it was down to about a dozen people. And then three or four of us formed Improved Variety Research, in, including Dr. Fair. And since that time, we've obviously progressed uh, significantly. So in those days, I assume that the, the operation was, was different, the scale was different, but probably the philosophy was, was the same. Is that fair to say? Well, the concepts are, are somewhat the same. It's interesting. Previously, I'd been asked about people that we admired, and one of them was Henry Wallace. And the reason I admired him was when he was still in high school, Iowa State College at that time had a summer program on corn production. And Henry went there, and they told him that on the open pollinated corn, which they had at that time, you saved the big ears. And he asked where the data was that you saved the big ears. And he was told that everyone knows that's what you do. So he picked large ears, medium ears, and very small ears and planted them in the backyard of their home in Des Moines and found out there was absolutely no difference between those. So we admire people that kind of take a contrarian view. And so the same thing on soybeans. When we first started, Walt Fair said, well, you throw away all the short ones. And I said, well, where's the data to support that? Well, we just know they aren't as good and farmers don't like short. And so guess what? We saved all the short ones. And right away, those became the best ones. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, flying in the face of convention there. So improved variety research, eventually moving to Midwest oil seeds in terms of the company, the breeding companies throughout the 1970s. So as the 1970s go on, you're breeding and developing these lines and licensing them to companies, right? And uh, so in 1979, Stein Seed Company, the brand, is born. I wonder if you talk a little bit about the idea and the motivation behind launching your own brand. You've already been successful as a licensing company at that time. Well, it's true. We were developing new varieties and, and putting them out to the seed trade. But we also thought if we had our own Stein brand marketing program, that that would give us an alternative use of our products. And we wouldn't be dependent on particular companies that may or may not take them and distribute them. And so we went down that path and say, again, that's worked out reasonably well. And so today we do both, and we have both genetics and traits today, which is very essential for a seed company. So in those earliest days of setting up that brand, did you have, uh, you know, Paul Bissinger, I know, came to work for the organization at that time. What was the vision for what you wanted to have for the retail brand at that time? What was your long-term vision for that? Well, this is very embarrassing. I had no idea. <laughs> how we would do going forward. We simply meant that we wanted to expand the organization and market our good varieties to as many farmers as we could. Well, that's a mission accomplished. So while we're talking about those days, I wondered, you know, we've had so many good soybeans released over the years, but there's a number that, you know, kind of throughout the history of the organization stands out, and that number is 2250. I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about the significance of that number as it relates to the history of Stein Seed. Well, everyone is familiar with the old 80-20 rule, and that tends to be true. So 20% of our new lines account for 80% of our revenue. And so a few good, good lines stick out over time. So originally there was a 2050 number that did extremely well. And then 2250s, it's interesting, 2250s had a few off-type plants in them. So you could drive down the highway and look at a field and spot it if it was 2250s. And I think, I don't know, we had 40 or 50 different companies selling that same product. So it was, it was very difficult to drive down the road and not see a field <laughs> in the area where they were adapted uh, of, of that variety. 
So we talk about soybean breeding and the methods that are employed by your company. It seems to me like a lot of people in the industry have had the opportunity to see the success that you've had and certainly would have the opportunity to emulate that. But it seems to me that no one has quite been able to sort of make that recipe work. I wonder if you can speak a little bit as to why, why it's worked so well here and maybe hasn't worked everywhere else. Well, it's very true that different people are emulating some degree to the things that we're doing. And I would believe it's improved their programs by doing so. But we think a lot of plant breeding has less to do with knowledge about plant breeding than it does about understanding probability. And so those people that have common sense and understand probability are able to utilize their plant breeding information and develop new products better and faster. And as a private entity, we can try new things all the time, and we do, and most of them fail. And when they fail, we just say, okay, that was a bad idea, and move on. And though most of those ideas may be mine, but nobody's going to fire me when they find out that I had a bad idea, which I have all the time, <laughs> incidentally, frequently. So I think we can move faster than most other larger entities. But to your point, there's a, sort of that keystone of, of research, which is a lot of theory and finding what works. And they don't all work, but it's, you know, I, I think Bill Eby one time said to me, 99% of what we do doesn't pan out, but it's the 1% that covers everything else. And that's the important part to remember. Well, and as you well know, Bill Levy will frequently say, we run yield trials and we keep the big bags. And that's about as complicated as it is. And there, there are a lot of other aspects to it, but that is the most important aspect. But I've often wondered about that phrase too, Harry, because I think to myself, is it possible that that whole idea is just so deceptively simple that people think, well, it can't possibly be that easy? Well, a lot of people today, particularly, want to sit at the desk and figure out all kinds of fancy ways to develop new higher yielding varieties. We simply say, whether it's corn or soybeans, just run the yield trials because yield trials tell you exactly what you're doing and data at the desk may or may not. Uh, it's helpful sometimes, but running the yield trial on multi-locations, multi-years is the best way to know the new products. Because one of the key elements, I think, the thread that's run through your organization all these years has been the idea of size, right? Volume being so critical for finding the very best material, right? That's in terms of, goes back to your idea of probability finding the very best material, you're only going to do that if you run a lot of evaluations, right? Yes. Uh, the key, we think the keys to plant breeding are volume, execution, and germplasm. So if you don't have good germplasm, it doesn't make any difference what you do. If you do a small volume, I always like to give the example that we're going to have basketball teams, and you're going to pick your team from 100 kids, and I'm going to pick my team from 10,000 kids. Who's going to win? It, it's simply a volume deal. Assuming you're able to separate the good kids from the bad kids. And I think back to your other point, which is I think these days there's a lot of talk about ways to find shortcuts, whether it be modeling or different kind of gene analysis. Maybe those help point us in the right direction, but it sounds like you're not convinced that it, it's a replacement for just running as many trials as you can run. Well, today, every university and every seed company and every crop is using marker-assisted breeding. And you can show data that a population coming from marker-assisted breeding is superior to a population that doesn't. So you're going to have a higher average yield of the lines coming out of that population. But we think this is exactly the wrong thing to be doing. I like to give the example, if we had this technology 100 years ago, we would pick the soybean varieties that yielded 20 bushels per acre and the corn that yielded 30 bushels per acre and say, boy, those are the genes we want in our new varieties. Does that make sense? <laughs> so they're looking at incremental gain and thinking that that's kind of the holy grail, whereas you're looking at looking for the outliers, looking for continual improvement, which comes through testing and evaluation and just moving that needle up each and every year. Yes, they will have an average higher yield coming out of the population, but they won't have the spikes, the extremely higher one, because they've limited themselves Talking a little bit about, I know, you know, every summer here we have these bulk populations, which are these uh, result of crosses that have been made, you know, in the prior year. And so you'll have 
these plants that are all kind of from the same A by B cross, right? And they're all sort of segregating for different things. And some of the things all fit within the same, you know, if you cross a two by a four, is it fair to say you're going to get a wide range of different maturities in the progeny, right? Is it any truth to the idea that some of the outliers, sometimes you'll get something that's exceptionally early or exceptionally late, more so than maybe even what the parentage would be. Are those outliers more interesting or are they just another outcropping of the same thing? Well, your point's well taken because what we're looking for in yield is an outlier. Right. We're looking for a new line that yields higher than either parent. And so we noted that outlying traits tend to go together. So if you've got a new line that's shorter than either parent or taller than either parent, earlier than either parent or later than either parent, the probability, and again, this is just a matter of probability, the probability goes up that that will be a superior line. It doesn't mean it's going to be, but the probability goes up. So we move always toward probability. I, I like to give another example if you're going to play in the NBA, you need to be tall. Just because you're tall doesn't mean you can play in the NBA. So using this selection system will give us a greater probability of new material, but doesn't guarantee that a particular line is going to be necessarily good. Sure. Doesn't, doesn't mean that it's going to be incrementally better than anything else. So I guess I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about corn. Obviously, we've, we've talked at length here about soybeans, but I wonder if we can talk a little bit about the corn breeding program. When did you start working with corn genetics? We started working with corn in the 1970s. And I would like to point out here that what little bit I know about corn mostly came from the publications of uh, Dr. Don Duvick, who was the research director at Pioneer. He retired in the 1990s. And when he retired, he did a study of all the hybrids from the 1930s through the 1990s. And what his study sh clearly showed was that ear size has changed very little during that, almost 100 years by now. And all of the gain is due to an increased population. But if you take those old varieties from the 1930s and plant them at a higher population, they go flat on the ground and you don't get anything. If you take today's varieties and plant at the low population of the 1930s, uh, it'll be one of the poorest hybrids you have. So, so that taught us that if you're going to have higher yielding hybrids, you're going to have to have higher populations. So we've moved that way. And it's interesting. When we move that way, we find out that we get shorter corn, corn with leaves up beside the tassels, and earlier, earlier flowering corn. So we don't select for any of those traits but when you select under high population, that's the, those are the traits that prevail. So Dr. Duvick's research, would it support the idea that you can get whatever you want out of the genetics? It's about whatever selection criteria you're using. If they were selecting at a certain population, you're going to get a material that's adapted for whatever criteria you kind of preset in the beginning. Is that kind of what he's going for? Yes, and this is the reason that university data on populations is almost always wrong. Because they say, which makes sense, they want a widely grown hybrid. Well, if it's widely grown, it's not brand new. It's older. And then they do a multi-year study of an old hybrid <laughs> and say, well, the ideal population is X. You can clearly see that they're way behind the times and their recommendation is, is off. Unless you're using one of those older hybrids that was generated at that point in time. So you talked about, you know, the path that you've been on for, for a number of years and if I remember right, you know, kind of in the early days of the corn program, it was about having, kind of like with soybeans, having as many locations as possibly could. And we had a lot of trials where we had a higher than typical population in the trials. Is that right? Correct. And that kind of ultimately led down this path of having a set of material that's really adapted for higher population. You know, right now, I think in the industry, there's getting to be more and more conversation about higher density corn, and in particular, the idea of shorter stature corn. I guess, what what's your thought? You know, this has been something that I, I know personally you've talked about for, for a long, long time. What is your thought as this starts to become a part of the major conversation in agriculture today? Well, let's back up a little bit. Remember I told you my father moved here in 1934? Right. For the entire decade of the 1930s, and there were a couple of bad years in there, 
But the entire decade, the average yield in the United States for corn, and incidentally, there was over 100 million acres every year planted during that decade because we didn't have soybeans. So there's actually more corn acreage than there is today. Wow. The average yield was 24 bushels per acre. Wow. So if you would have told my father when he moved here, your kid will be able to get 10 times that amount. <laughs> no one would have thought that was even, that was totally crazy. And so when we tell people today we're going to double yields, they say, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> well, we think doubling is fairly easy. 10 times is, is kind of a push. Uh, so corn is an amazing crop. And, and so we think the, the yields will continue to go up significantly. And, and you think this idea, I mean, we talked earlier about the fact that the, the data seems to be pretty clear that over the last 80 or 90 years, you know, what we've done is increase populations. And that's ultimately been a large portion of the result of the increase in, in corn yield. Is that fair to say? That's virtually all the increase. And incidentally, that, that increase is due to a combination of factors, genetics being one of them, equipment, the planting equipment, the harvesting equipment, the fungicides, the insecticides, the herbicides. That combination of things is, is what's given us uh, this tenfold increase in yield. So like I said, I know we've had a lot of groups come on the farm and, and you've talked to a lot of groups about this concept. And I would say even as recently as a decade ago, that was a harder sell, I think. So what do you, you know, do you think that now the time is right? Now you've got more voices added to this conversation. Do you think that the message is, is coming through that this is really the path, the future of corn? Well, there are more people in that boat today than there were 10, 15 years ago. But still, it's very difficult to get farmers to change their habits. And when I was a boy, our standard planting rate was 17,000 plants per acre. And incidentally, when Dubik started his study in the 1930s, the average planting rate was 7,000 plants per acre. And so today, it's somewhere in the mid-30s. Well, we think our, our very newest hybrids need to be on the top side of 40. And incidentally, though, that's in, also in narrower rows. I, I need to back up again. In the 1930s, the row width was 42 to 48 inches because you had to get your horse down the row. <laughs> and then when they moved to 30s, that was a significant increase. And today, we think 20s is a better row width. And 15s are even slightly higher in yield. But when you take the extra cost of the planter units, the extra cost of the cornhead units, the extra weight that you're pulling across the field, we think the 20-inch rows are probably the logical thing for most commercial farmers. Yeah, so it goes beyond just changing the genetics. It's about now changing cultural practice because row spacing and all these other things are now a factor, right, as you start to bump up against the limits of what can be done in a you know, 30-inch row, for example. But like this past winter, I know Warren... Stein was on a panel with two other individuals from major seed companies, and the topic was short stature, high population corn. And I guess I was fascinated at the idea that I didn't know that was a day that was going to come. At points, we wondered if we were the only ones that were ever going to talk about this. So I guess, what do you take from that? You, you know, do you think this is going to be something that's going to stick and finally reach that critical mass for growers to really start to latch on to? Well, as you're well aware, in the beginning, people said, oh, Harry doesn't know what he's doing. That stuff is no good. And so now they're starting to change their mind a little bit and coming around to realizing that is the future and, and the way we're going to go. I, I'd like to make a comparison. Crow's Seed Company were the first people to introduce single cross hybrids. And they were the only ones. So they had higher yielding hybrids because of that. But did the whole industry move to those? No, they didn't. When the major corn companies came out and said, oh, single crosses are the way to go. Then everybody moved to those. So it's interesting that it's very difficult to get the farm community to move in a direction unless some, some of the major companies are pushing it. But today, as you point out, they are. And so we feel, yes, uh, this material will be much more easily accepted. So a while back, we had Myron Stein on the Seacast, and we were talking about the expansion of Stein to really a global brand as it reaches out into some other parts of, of the world. I guess I'm curious as to your thoughts on the expansion of Stein brand into other markets beyond North America. Well, we're selling into China. We're selling into uh, the Eastern Bloc countries in Europe, potentially into South Africa. And, and 
we actually sell more corn in Brazil than we do in the United States today. And I know, I think some of the uh, research operations, you know, sometimes there's some bleed through. I think we have a soybean in our catalog this year that's going to be probably the first product came from South America now into the North American market. So is there certainly, is there synergies there for being able to work with products or genetics that come from another market and maybe have benefit in one of these other markets? Well, we have breeding programs, obviously, in, in both North and South America. And, and remember the variability. So when they get an early line in South America, they may say, well, we can't use it here. And so we can use it here and vice versa. It it was interesting. At the state universities, usually their goal is to breed for their state. And so when Iowa would breed soybeans, if they were too early for Iowa, they would throw them away. If they were too late for Iowa, they would throw them away. (laughs) Well, remember, these are the transgressive segregates. They're exactly where most of the time the better material will lie. And so, again, when you have breeding on two different continents— you're able to shift material to wherever it's most adapted. Your, your comment there just brought something to mind that I just thought about that I definitely wanted to ask you about. You know, sometimes we'll run into folks who say, to me, what's most important is how it does right here at home. You know, I had a conversation with, with someone at one point that, that said, all I care about is how that product did, you know, across the road from my house. And we got in a long conversation about the idea of widely adapted material. I know that's something that is kind of a very important foundational element of our program is, is looking at what we call widely adapted material. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about that idea about the importance of having something that's widely adapted. Yeah, we frequently get people, as you point out, that they want to know just what happened in their backyard. And we think this is entirely wrong. What they really want to know is what's happened over a wide area on a multi-year basis. And my favorite thing is, let's, let's take Nebraska and Indiana, because Nebraska has dry, low humidity conditions. Indiana has higher humidity, more, more disease problems. And you say, well, you, you don't want material that's adapted to both of those. Well, guess what? There will be the year when Indiana is drier. This might be the year when they're, they've, yeah. they've had a lot of heat out there. Yeah. And conversely, there will be a year when Nebraska has more humidity and more moisture. And so if they've picked a variety that only does well under their what they thought would be their circumstances, they'll find out it goes in the tank in one of these years when the environment is different than you would normally expect. So a, a widely adapted product is the safest and best and, and on the average higher yielding in the long run. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're going to hit the top necessarily. You might have one product that has a perfect year in a perfect location. But back to your comment, it's about probability, right? The best probability is finding the product that did well across 30 locations rather than finding the one product that did well right next door to you. Correct. And so it will be the highest yielding across the road from you on a multi-year basis. It might not be on a particular one-year basis. Yeah. And we really don't care about one year. We care about multi-years. By the probability, you're going to do better on average than you would otherwise. So I'm curious, things that have happened in agriculture during your time, is there one or a couple of things that stand out most to you that most amaze you about the advancements in agriculture? Well, would you believe when I was a very young boy, we had horses in our barn, horses to to work the fields with. Sure. And, And I can't remember it, but when my father moved here, there was no electricity on this farm. So the point is, there's been radical changes in all kinds of technology. You constantly have to adjust. If you aren't adjust, you're going to get left behind. So thinking about that and the and the pace of change and some of the things that are happening now, are there things right now in the soybean side or the corn side or the farm operation itself that really have you excited and excited for what's to come? Well, I think it's just simply a combination of everything. But we think being able to develop corn hybrids that are higher quality, that have quality traits, may be a key moving forward in the future. So if a farmer can grow more bushels, that's good. But if you can grow more bushels of a higher value product, that is even more important. And so that is one of the areas that we're going to push on uh, that we expect to be uh, in the future. So if you had to boil it down, wondering if there's something that you would attribute your success to? Well, we've, hey, we've been fortunate. You have to sort of be at the right place at the right time. That's part of it. But then the work ethic, 
I, I, I make jokes. We've got a guy across the hall here that works half time, half time being six to six. <laughs> and I tell people, it's not unusual. He'll come in late on Sunday. <laughs> and so I give him heck when he comes in late on Sunday. But hard work and never asking someone in our system to do something that I wouldn't do. I think that's, that's very important. When they see me doing the very things that they wouldn't expect, then they're willing to jump in and push hard. We have a better workforce than the average company because of that, I think. You strike me as somebody who's goal-oriented. Would that be true? Well, we always set goals, and then when we hit them, we, we reset them <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. and, and make them higher. I'll take that as a yes then. So my question to you is, what's something on your goal list today? that we haven't gotten to, but you met a goal you want to accomplish? Well, because we think we're in developing better corn hybrids, better soybean lines, we want to see those planted on as many farm acres as we can, because that will make our fellow farmers uh, more prosperous and, and more revenue. And so whatever we can do to expand that, that that's your job, incidentally, to get that done. Okay. Uh, whatever we can do to expand that, that's where we're trying to push. Well, Harry, thank you so much for joining us for this 50th episode of the Stein Seedcast. Your story is an inspiration to everyone in the company and everyone in the industry. And we were very fortunate for you to share it with us today. Thank you. You're welcome. So that's our time for today. I'd like to thank our guests and our listeners for joining us on another episode of the Stein Seedcast. We'll be back again soon with more expert interviews and insights about all things Stein. And to never miss an episode, Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. To learn more about Stein and its elite corn and soybean genetics, visit steinseed.com. Stein has yield.